Okay, so welcome as you are entering. So welcome everyone tonight to the April 12th monthly meeting, Sarasota Audubon. And as you enter, let us know where you're viewing from. What, what birds are you seeing this week? So I got my first today. I've got a, a scarlet tanager and a black-throated blue warbler. Oh, nice. Up in my oak and my um, mulberry. Oh, wonderful. up to 46 people. So if you guys want to, well, because I'm sharing, I can't see the chat. Isn't that interesting? There it is. Okay. Suzanne Dameron from St. Pete saw a mockingbird happily this morning. Okay. Let's hear from a few others. What are you seeing? Ooh, Jean got a Kentucky warbler in her backyard. Cool. Ooh, a kinglet in Yonkers, New York. Great. Carolyn, that's Carolyn McLaughlin. William Mice was doing his taxes. Sorry. <laughs> I guess you weren't looking out the it's window. Me. It's me. Okay, thank you, William. Sorry, William. Lorraine Wiseman saw a limpkin. Rebecca Lees, um, Venice saw a brown thrasher. Thrasher. Nancy McClellan, uh, Northern Perula, while she was picking blueberries. Nice. Lynn, uh, J Lynn J, our very own, saw a scarlet tanager in Pinecraft. All right, Christine Hoffman saw a bald eagle at Benderson. And hi, David from Northport. Red Crossbills, Janet Paisley's in Charlottesville, Virginia. This is fun too to see where everyone's coming from. Yeah. But that's very cool, Janet. Okay, well, uh, Alan Gardner saw six glossies on University Parkway. All right, yeah, they're, they're adapting, aren't they? Okay, well, it looks like we've got 53 at this point. Um, and I'm gonna stop sharing for, or maybe not. We'll move on. Um, oh, Linda Fields. In Riverside, Connecticut, ospreys and young eagles. She's got eaglets. All right. There we go. All right. I'm going to stop sharing for the moment and we'll let Jean start. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. It's wonderful to see you. And it's great looking at all the birds that are coming through. That storm last night and uh, early this morning really helped push those birds down, which is al always what we love. So I'm Jean Doobie, president of the Sarasota Audubon Society. I can say still president of the Sarasota Audubon Society. Um, it seems to be an ongoing thing. And uh, which leads me into an announcement of today, we have the annual election of officers. Uh, our bylaws state that the nominating committee make recommendations um, of officers at the April meeting and that, and normally we would conduct a show of hands at our church hall, but now since we are unable to conduct those meetings in person, 
um, we will do our vote electronically. If you recall, we did it last year as well, and it really worked well. Um, here's the thing, only members are allowed to vote. So after this meeting, um, Sarasota Audubon, the nominating committee will be sending out a list of all officers standing for election via Survey Monkey. Um, so go ahead and indicate your vote. There's a space to nominate names if you choose to do so. Once you submit it, uh, it will be registered automatically and we will let you know what the results are in tw within 24 hours. So the nominating committee, Karen Schneider, Don Schneider and Glynis Thomas, report that they have not received any nominations from the membership. They did ask the uh, current officers if they would um, uh, stand for a re-election and they all said yes. So um, at this time, the slate of officers who will, who will stand for election are Jean Doobie, president, Catherine Young, first vice president, Lynn Jacobau, second vice president, Mary Heinen, secretary, and Jean Doobie, treasurer. So look out for that survey monkey and please um, report that, um, make your, cast your vote and send it back to us. So thank you for that. That's a housekeeping thing we took care of. Um, I will t give you a, a little update on the quad. Karen uh, is gonna Karen, put up a it. photo yeah. of the quad. Uh, for those who, don't know or need to be reminded, there are three parcels of land adjacent to the celery fields, which um, Sarasota Audubon um, has pledged to rewild and to, um, it's, it's not restoring it to native habitat, but we are <coughs> going to vegetate it. And we're going through an elaborate process right now, as you can imagine, it is county land, it is, under a lease to Sarasota Audubon for a number of years. And um, so we're going through that process. But what we do know, what we have done is we have in conjunction with the Conservation Foundation of the Gulf Coast, we are partners in this project. We have jointly engaged Steve Swa, PE. I think that means professional engineer, which he is by the way. He's from Progressive Water Resources, and he is going to be our owner's representative, which means that he is working on behalf of Audubon and the Conservation Foundation to shepherd this whole project through. And this project requires a lot of detail, a lot of permitting uh, with multiple county agencies and all sorts of things that are really, um, beyond any one of us to handle. We need a professional to do that. And that's what we're doing. So I must say that um, in this role, Steve will work with us and the engineering firm where that has to be determined. We don't quite know who that is yet to ensure that we get the best service and the best design for birds, habitat and people. Some of you may know Steve Swar. Uh, Steve knows, knows the celery fields upside down and inside out. He was the head of the stormwater division of Sarasota County when the fields were being developed for flood protection way back in the late 90s. And he was the first county person to engage with Audubon in the vision of enhancing the celery fields to what it is today. So we're in really good hands with Steve. So we're really happy that he's now going through the process of um, engaging an engineering firm uh, with all that that entails, which is hugely complicated. So we're very happy to have him on board. So that's my update for now. And um, I'm gonna turn you over to Margie, who's going to introduce our wonderful speaker today. First, um, let me just go over the housekeeping details just in case there's anybody new tonight. Um, after the, um, or d anytime during the talk, you can ask questions by typing in the Q&A at the bottom. So there's a box at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A, and that's how we keep track of our questions. And Margie will use that afterwards. 
You can use the chat for logistical questions, anything about Zoom. Uh, um, I'm, I'm happy to answer that through chat, but it's easier for us to keep track of the Q&A, um, the questions through Q&A. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Marty. Hi, thank you all, good evening. Um, I'm excited to introduce our speaker, but in um, talking before our meeting formally tonight, um, I thought it might be a good idea to um, tell everybody that um, there is a lot of, um, as you may or may not know, there's a lot of uh, groups and individuals very concerned about uh, the leakage issues at Piney Point, uh, the phosphate uh, stacks. And um, I think we may need to do a presentation on this just later uh, this uh, spring and summer. But for now, perhaps uh, everybody ought to, especially if you're looking on what to do or how to contribute, if not time, then money, uh, contact the Suncoast Water Keepers. Is that correct, Karen? Yes. Or, or contact Karen. I, I don't want Karen to be beleaguered with, with uh, but Karen, is there anything you'd like to add? Because Karen, and, and actually so is Melissa on top of this. Um, in the Melissa shared a great press release from the um, Center for Biological Diversity, um, which I can put in. I'll put a link to that in our upcoming newsletter and folks great. can learn more um, that way. It's also in the chat. Melissa, our speaker tonight, contributed a link to that. Is that I'll add it. It may not have shown up, but I'll, I'll copy it and put it in now because it was Oh, OK. That before. would be great. Yeah. OK. Just and if put it in the chat box if anybody's interested. And if anybody has suggestions for speakers, please contact me because this is of concern to us all, I know. So I'm, I'm thrilled um, to introduce to you Melissa Abdo, who is back by, by uh, she was a very popular speaker before. And um, it's personally really touching to me. Uh, Melissa is a dear friend of mine. And so I'm very happy to have her here as well. So Dr. Melissa Abdo is now National Park Conservation Association's Regional Director for the Sun Coast, which essentially means, as I understand it, South Florida. And think Everglades, for sure, and Biscayne Bay, right? Well, she'll tell you more about this, I'm sure. But Melissa is a conservation biologist who hails originally from Miami. Um, she'll be speaking about saving the greater Everglades ecosystem with a specific focus on Big Cypress National Park. Uh, Dr. Abdo is an accomplished biodiversity explorer with years of experience in nonprofit and private sector leadership roles. She has led major biodiversity research expeditions in over 15 countries. And her work has been supported by the MacArthur Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, and the National Geographic Society, among others. She is the recipient of several fellowships and awards, recognizing her work to jointly enhance community livelihoods and conservation outcomes. She did her dissertation research abroad in Indonesia, where she studied forest ecology. Specifically, she did her research on the Papuan hornbill, which is the biggest of the hornbills, and its role in dispersing seeds of forest trees and palms all over the place. Uh, I got to tell you, I think this is just fascinating. And she was in some really, really, really exotic areas. <laughs> Speaks Malaysian, Malay, the Malaysian language, the Bahasa. Malay and Bahasa. Yes. Indonesia. Um, so we're delighted she's here with us today. So welcome, Dr. Abdo. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be here with you all. And I'm going to uh, share screen in a moment. But I just wanted to first really thank everyone. Thank Margie and Jean and Karen for inviting me to be here with Sarasota Audubon tonight. It's a pleasure to uh, present to you all. And I'm sorry, I don't have any pictures of fun hornbills from the other side of the world, but maybe maybe I'll get an invitation back for another year. And, and you will. 
<laughs> okay, well, with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Is that working for you all? Yes. Wonderful. So good evening again, everyone. Um, it's just such a pleasure to be here. And tonight I will be taking you through a story of saving the greater Everglades ecosystem, replete with rare bats, big cats, and a discovery in the river of grass. Um, so before I get into the presentation, and you should be seeing my second slide now, I'll look to Margie, Margie or Karen to holler if there's any screen sharing issues. Um, but before I get in, into the presentation, I wanted to introduce our organization in case anyone is not yet familiar with National Parks Conservation Association. So National Parks Conservation Association or NPCA, we were founded 101 years ago by several of the founding fathers of the US national park system to serve as a citizen advocacy organization that would focus on protecting and enhancing America's national park system for current generations and, and those to come. Um, so today's talk is very much in that spirit of being a voice for America's protected parks. And when we think of saving the greater Everglades ecosystem, several things often come to mind for folks. Um, perhaps some may envision the vast landscape you know, where wetlands, cypress, pinelands, and other iconic Floridian habitats are juxtaposed against development. And perhaps others immediately think of Everglades National Park, the namesake park for which the Everglades um, carries the name. Or some people may think about SERP, the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan authorized by Congress back in the year 2000, which has since become the world's largest ecosystem restoration effort ever. So some of those uh, things may have come to your mind when you consider the Everglades or saving the Everglades, but today I'm going to focus on a lesser known yet critically important part of the greater Everglades ecosystem, and that is Big Cypress National Preserve. I'm also going to share a personal story of discovery in the preserve, which I hope will be uplifting for you. And lastly, I'm going to dive into some of the lesser known threats facing the ecosystem, namely around proposed new oil and gas extraction which is especially relevant in this time when we're all focusing on climate change and looking to the greater Everglades as a key in really providing uh, the means to build greater regional climate resilience. And further, given that you are all based in Sarasota or familiar with Sarasota and in other places of the country, uh, you know, and Sarasota being just a click north of Big Cypress, I felt that highlighting Big Cypress would be of interest to you given that major clean water flows through Big Cypress Preserve down into the vital estuaries of Southwest Florida and provides integral habitat for birds and other diverse wildlife of Southwest Florida. So here you should be seeing a map and this is the entire region of what I'm referring to when I say the greater Everglades ecosystem. And that, that region is noted in green with various key park areas noted as well. And if you take a close look at the map, Big Cypress National Preserve, which is our country's first ever established national preserve, it was established back in 1974, and that is circled in red if you take a close look at the map. So Big Cypress is a fascinating, wild, and beautiful preserve where temperate species like its famous cypress trees mingle with bromeliads and orchids, of tropical provenance. And I have fallen to absolutely love this preserve. And I'm going to share with you one of my swamp stories that I only started sharing recently. So please bear with me. So my big cypress story starts out here in the river of grass. And almost 20 years ago, I found myself, as I often find myself when in the Everglades, staring out across the grass. But that day, my staring was for a purpose. I was at that time earlier in my career as a conservation biologist, and I was one of the lead researchers entrusted with carrying out 
some of the first major biodiversity inventories in a number of South Florida's key protected areas, including national parks, and among them, Big Cypress. So on that day and the time before, we were working specifically to identify all the plant life, so every single species within the preserve's boundaries. And on the day this story begins, I had already spent many days hiking out and about in Big Cyprus, undertaking this research. And in fact, I'd spent many muddy days out across all of the greater Everglades. And this is the landscape that I grew up in. But something happened on that particular day that made it a new beginning for me. I had a great idea and I wanted to see if I could make a new scientific discovery in the preserve. And so this brings me back to that grass that I was staring at. The idea was to try to find an incredibly rare plant species found nowhere else on earth. And you guessed it, it's a kind of grass species. So this one grass species was incredibly rare. It was previously only known to science from a tiny spot in Everglades National Park where it was first discovered in 1903. And uh, while, and, and it was an endemic species, so while it might not be an orchid or another charismatic species, all endemic species, as we know, are very important to preserving all of biodiversity. So the idea to search for the species, trying to see if I could discover it in a new area, it was exciting for me, but it was also really daunting. So if I were to be honest with myself at that time, I was daunted because I thought, you know, who was I but a young scientist? Who was I to think that I could find something that others may have overlooked or not had the determination to search for? And on a far more pragmatic note, I thought, you know, grass species are incredibly difficult to identify and tell apart. And the big cypress, like the rest of the river of grass, is indeed made up of a ton of grasses. And so there are about 151 species of grasses in Big Cypress. And if you count the grass lookalikes from other plant families, you know, the sedges and rushes, you're talking over 240 species to tell apart. Um, but I went ahead and I dove in to try to find a literal needle in a haystack. And so that day I searched and searched for the species called Digitaria pausiflora or Everglades crabgrass as it is commonly known. And eventually, as you're probably guessing, this story has a happy ending. I made the discovery. The needle in the haystack was spotted when my eyes set upon a blade of grass that was ever so slightly different. And here it is, Digitaria pausiflora in all its glory. And uh, that is the story of how the Everglades crabgrass first became officially discovered anew inside Big Cypress. And this discovery was important to me because it helped ignite a profound desire to do more to contribute to science and to conservation. And it also taught me that, uh, you know, there's so much that remains to be discovered. And we went on through that discovery inside Big Cypress and others that I made during this research uh, carried out with colleagues across the preserve we were fortunate to garner data needed to uh, attain eventual formal protections, formal legal protections for digitaria and other species. And today that Everglades crabgrass is federally protected under the Endangered Species Act as a threatened species. And again, that discovery back in Big Cypress, it also impressed upon me the fact that so much still remained to be discovered about our planet. And now returning full circle back from that fateful day of discovery to the present time, I am compelled to speak up for Big Cypress because of what I have witnessed in the preserve for the past several years. And Big Cypress certainly needs our protection, our science and our voices once again. And so now I will segue here and move into the reason Big Cypress needs our protection and our voices more than ever. And that is um, because there is a new threat facing the preserve regarding oil and gas. So here we see a map of Big Cypress and the Greater Everglades ecosystem, of which Big Cypress is, of course, an integral upstream Western component. And Big Cypress encompasses around 729,000 acres 
It's a fundamental part of the ecosystem. And it includes, as you can see, the broader ecosystem that is includes Everglades National Park to the south and Biscayne National Park further to the east, along with other conservation lands. And the ecosystem overall is critical to providing drinking water to one third of Floridians. It provides vital freshwater flows to valuable estuaries and fisheries. And Big Cypress alone flows approximately 40% of the water that eventually makes its way into Everglades National Park and contiguous vital coastal estuaries. So with that context, now we look at the uh, issue of oil extraction. Now legacy oil extraction has actually existed in very limited areas of the preserve for decades. But what I'm speaking about today has only been occurring since 2017 and it's damaging new activity. So since 2017, Big Cypress has been the site of a new hunt for oil inside the boundaries of the preserve. NPCA and our allies all fought against allowing this new oil hunt to happen but the National Park Service and the state of Florida's Department of Environmental Protection permitted it to proceed inside the preserve. Now that was in 2017 and 2018. Uh, this, that, that oil hunt, I'll show you some pictures in a moment, it consisted of what is called a, a seismic, uh, seismic exploration for oil. Now, just about 10 weeks ago, less than 10 days into the new Biden administration and hopeful for a new climate-friendly national agenda, unfortunately, disastrous news came our way. The very same oil company that had done the damaging seismic surveys in 2017 and 2018 was now back with a new proposal. They now want to develop oil in two different areas of the preserve. And if this were permitted to proceed, this would be uh, the first new oil operations allowed in the preserve in decades. So I'm gonna show you now through pictures firsthand what that oil hunt has looked like. It consists of a private oil company utilizing massive industrial vehicles called fibrocyte vehicles to traverse previously largely pristine and roadless areas of the preserve and search for oil using seismic technology. And these vehicles can weigh up to 33 tons and they were driven across nearly 112 miles of the preserve. To give you a sense of that scope, that is roughly the distance across the South Florida Peninsula driving from Miami to Naples. All of that inside the preserve. Um, they mowed down state listed endangered flora, compacted and rutted soils, and really had serious impacts. Um, this picture was taken here uh, in the dry season very shortly after the area was first damaged. And this next image is a picture that I took during the wet season of 2019, when you can see all the stumps of Cyprus that the company cut down to make way for the vehicles. And then moving along, this is the uh, last image I'll show of what uh, the drier season looked like in March, 2020. And what you're seeing there is not a trail. It is called a seismic line, which is the disturbed pathway that was cut out by those um, vibrocyte vehicles. And you can see clearly it's still nearly devoid of vegetation uh, over two years after it was first degraded by that uh, seismic activity. And many of these areas I've personally observed still have not recovered or come close to recovery in my professional opinion, despite the Park Service and our state's Department of Environmental Protection stating that they consider most of them to be, quote, reclaimed. But science and the naked eye indicate that this is not so. Adding insult to injury, some of the areas that this recent damage took place in are extremely nearby the Florida National Scenic Trail. And this image is of the Florida Scenic Trail through a pine flatwood prairie and shows what intact native habitats should look like with a minimal footpath traversing them. And next is an image of what, uh, what the Florida Trail looks like when it's traversing healthy wet cypress habitat. And in stark contrast here, here's the picture again that I took in Dwarfed Cypress Swamp where the seismic vehicles destroyed habitat. You can clearly see the difference. And I can tell you, it also feels very different to hike 
in a destroyed swath of habitat lined with stumps of hundreds of cypress trees that were cut or mowed down. And going beyond how it looks or feels, NPCA and our allies have supported independent third party scientific monitoring of the impacts of these seismic lines cut across Big Cypress. And that monitoring has been conducted at numerous points along these seismic lines that destroyed swath that you're seeing there. Um, and the, the measurements have indicated that there are different impacts like um, differing water depths and an examination of vegetation has shown that species and abundance data are remain to be totally off within these degraded seismic lines. So I won't go too deep into the details since we're, we're only together a short time today, but suffice to say that there are numerous negative impacts that are well-documented um, including over 500 cypress trees that were cut down according to official data. Um, most of them dwarf cypress trees whose age is not necessarily indicated by their height, meaning that trees that are small or short in stature can actually easily be hundreds of years old. So the biodiversity of these seismic lines is really totally different from the surrounding areas. And in many places, it's also now dominated by, um, in some places, uh, a monoculture of a species called Eleocris. And in many other places, the vegetation uh, remains very different. And we also see symptoms that the uh, water flow has been changed due to different levels of um, water depths. And this is happening in the very landscape where we are trying to restore healthy hydrologic water flow. So next, and I hope this works for you all, I'm, I'm gonna show you a, a video that's uh, alarming. This is a video uh, that we received upon request through the Freedom of Information Act from the National Park Service themselves. And this is taken from inside one of those vibrocyte vehicles. And it clearly shows a tree that has state listed endangered species, the Talantia species being mowed down, and it's going through a previously undisturbed cypress wetland. So that's what the, uh, the seismic hunt for oil looked like in action. So now that you've seen what's going on inside Big Cypress, it, it helps to put this in context by considering some of the diverse species at stake. And so I'd like to show you some of the amazing swamp life that Big Cypress is home to. And so here we have the beautiful ghost orchid found only in Cuba and South Florida. And uh, hearkening back to that research I did two decades ago, some of the research that, that we conducted helped to find out what we now know for certain. And that is that Big Cypress holds the most ghost orchids. That is, it has the largest population of them anywhere in the world. It is also home to numerous other rare orchid and bromeliad and fern species, um, such as this certipodium in the middle here. And Big Cypress is also habitat to Florida's rarest bat species. And my bat expert friends tell me, in fact, that it is the country's rarest bat species, and that is the Florida bonneted bat. And Big Cypress is also crucial for the bat's survival. And I can't uh, speak amongst Audubon folks without, of course, flagging the, the amazing abundance of birds and the stellar bird biodiversity that Big Cypress is home to. And I hope that uh, if you haven't all gone out to, to check out the birds in Big Cypress that you will when it's safe. So last but not at all least in terms of biodiversity, we really can't talk about Big Cypress without talking about Florida panthers. And it's estimated as, as many of you well know that panthers are extremely rare, estimated to only be around, uh, around 120 to 230 adult panthers surviving today. They are among the rarest mammals in the US and they are only known to breed in South Florida with the largest contiguous range being in the Big Cypress and surrounds. And just during 2020 alone, sadly, there were 14 deaths, 13 of which were caused by vehicle collisions. So if you crunch the numbers, if such a large chunk of the panther population is killed each year, we really need to do all we absolutely can to protect them. And now this is not the best map that I am putting up here, but we're still working to finalize this. As I shared with you all, this 
latest oil threat only occurred. Um, we only learned about it 10 weeks ago. So this map isn't finalized, but I wanted to give you all a sneak preview tonight. And, and what I'd like to highlight here are just two things within this map that is showing a small portion of Big Cypress that is the site of where one of the proposed oil developments would be sited. So first thing to focus on is that red line across your screen there. That is the proposed new oil road and access pad. And you can see that it would cut across the area, essentially marring the flow of water that should go from north to south. And second, I'd like to draw your attention to all of those orange dots on the map. Those are all Panther telemetry data points showing us that this proposal lies solidly within prime Panther habitat. So seeing all these images and impacts, I imagine many of you are asking yourselves, how could all of this have been permitted to happen inside the boundaries of our nation's first preserve? Well, Big Cypress is one of 12 National Park System park units that have active oil and gas drilling within their borders because it is what is known as a split estate where subsurface mineral rights remain privately held. And in this case, most of those rights are held inside the preserve by the Collier family and have been leased out to the oil company, Burnett Oil Company, um, to conduct that, their seismic uh, oil hunt. But I would like to take you for a moment back to the preserves enabling legislation to take a little bit of a deeper policy dive. So if we go to the preserves enabling legislation, and by the way, every park unit has unique enabling legislation, and you can see it online. Um, so the Big Cypress was established by Congress to assure the preservation, conservation, and protection of the natural, scenic, hydrologic, floral, and faunal, and recreational values of Big Cypress watershed. It further went on to stipulate that limited oil exploration and development must be done in a way that ensures the ecological integrity of the place is, is retained. And as you can see with those direct quotes from the legislation, uh, the interpretation is that the National Park Service and thus the Department of Interior, which of course oversees the National Park Service, they were granted the power to limit or control the use of these lands in regards to extractive activities. And so the take home point here is that the National Park Service has broad authority to reject oil and gas activities. And I'd also like to lastly, last piece of policy tonight, I'd like to ask you to recall the Organic Act, which is a fundamental piece of environmental law in the US. And if you haven't read it, I encourage you to read this legislation. Uh, it's, it's a key take home point here on the Organic Act is that the park system must regulate park system units like Big Cypress in a way that ensures that they will be left unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. And so when NPS, sorry, the National Park Service authorized this, this oil hunt to proceed um, back in 2016, which paved the way for those disastrous 2017 and 2018 seismic hunts, they did so via a document that is called a finding of no significant impact. Um, it's, it's basically a, like a type of permit and in there, there were 47 conditions that were to have been met. And since then, our independent science studies have well-documented evidence in numerous reports, um, some of which I, I pulled out from to share with you today, uh, which were all submitted to the Park Service that indicated that most of those conditions were not actually met. So in addition, we also conducted a thorough review of the monitoring study that the company is required to do. And I can share with you that their study, frankly, uh, it wouldn't have held up in an undergraduate college level ecology class, much less should it be uh, held as a standard or appropriate for our country's first national preserve. And so I would argue that Big Cypress deserves the highest protections afforded by law. So what are we doing to help ensure that those protections come to bear for Big Cypress? 
Well, we are working with many allies and have launched uh, fully into action in, in the 10 weeks since we've learned of this new proposal to develop new oil and gas inside Big Cypress. We have already led an effort to bring 100 conservation groups together to ask the new Department of Interior Secretary, Deb Holland, to deny applications for permitting to drill for new oil in Big Cypress. We've also written to Secretary Valenstein of Florida's Department for Environmental Protection and provided scientific reports on why he should deny the state of Florida's 404 applications that would allow this oil development to proceed. And we are also celebrating the leadership and voices of tribal elders, um, like the, the image that is shown here. Um, this, is, this was a hike that occurred just this past weekend. It was led by Betty Osceola, uh, a Miccosukee elder in collaboration with a Seminole member, Seminole tribe member. And we are just thrilled to celebrate the leadership of these tribal led efforts. Uh, and lastly, we have also conducted analyses of new aerial imagery uh, like I'm showing you here that show even today, those lines in the landscape, that those are seismic scars that are still visible from the air. So if you're interested in taking action and uh, reaching out to ask that our leaders, our elected leaders and agencies oppose this oil drilling in Big Cypress and help save the greater Everglades ecosystem, here on screen are a couple of our specific asks to our federal and state agencies. And I'd like to now start wrapping up and leaving you with some images of these diverse species inside the preserve that again, remind us how many, how much of a reason we have to protect this, this iconic and special place, how there's really no place on earth like it. And yet it's, it's so integral to the overall greater Everglades ecosystem. And this, you know, this brings me full circle back to that story that I started out with. Parks need to retain their ecological integrity for future generations. You know, had I been faced by a dismal, destroyed, and not nearly as diverse swamp years ago, uh, such as I've now been seeing replacing the swamp life that I know and love in those damaged areas, you know, had I seen such a dismal habitat 20 years ago, my whole life could have panned out differently. You know, I would not have known what Everglades landscapes really look like in all their glory. And I probably would not have been inspired to persevere and make discoveries um, in my own career as a scientist and conservationist. And so I would, I would argue and uh, advocate for every single blade of grass inside the Big Cypress to be protected and conserved. Every young person and every American deserves this biodiversity and ecosystem health, and we must not permit any future damage inside our nation's first preserve, and we must do our utmost to restore America's great Everglades. So I'd like to ask you if you've found this information and story I've shared to be of interest to join us in saving Big Cypress, which really means saving the greater Everglades ecosystem, and here are a couple of ways you can do so. You can visit our Big Cypress website and also stay connected with us. Sign up to receive email updates, uh, which we very rarely send, but we send them when they're, when they're pertinent. So thank you so much. And that rounds out my talk today. And now I'd like to pass the floor back to Margie to take questions. Oh, Margie, you're Mar muted. Uh, hi, Melissa. Can you possibly go back to that slide uh, where people could um, write to the National Park Service about the Burnett oil for just a minute? Because I think you um, understandably went through that a little fast. And I think it's important that people be able to um, make the notes there. If that's Absolutely. Possible. Yeah, that, yes. Absolutely, yeah. I, I went. I had. I know I had a lot of material to cover, so I wanted to move through quickly no, for you all this evening. We can um, help you with this as well. So it's it's um okay. That this is great to know. 
So the question, um, do you know the names of who to get in touch with at DEP? Yes, uh, at DEP, so it's really important that folks write to DEP and I can also send an email update if you, if you wanna share it um, with any of your, your members. Um, we wrote, I can even share the exact letter that we wrote and that we sent to the DEP, but basically you'll simply address all correspondence to Secretary Valenstein, Noah Valenstein, who is the head of the DEP. And it's important because currently the oil company's permits are in the DEP system. So by writing to the DEP and also citing the permit numbers, which I can share with you via email, uh, then you can ensure that your letter goes on record with the DEP and they will be required to review your letter when reviewing those applications. Yes, great. If you send that to me, I'll be sending the, the monthly What's Up newsletter out on Friday and right. we'll make sure it gets in there. Oh, thank you very much, both you and Karen. I, I just think this is, and also we need to really support the National Parks Conservation Association, but uh, this is just so alarming. So uh, thank you for showing that again. So shall we go to Q&A? And Melissa, thank you so much. I, uh, before we even go there, I just like to really, um, I'm very moved by your incredibly intense efforts. Um, I know you're busy very many weekends. I hear some alarm in the back, some phone alarm going off here. It's probably a lost yeah. child or something. Um, but I, I just really want to acknowledge uh, your work. I know it takes 24 seven, you were out over the weekend, you were with those Indians, uh, those Indian protesters and Adam, I actually was not. I was not. I, I wish I was. I was with him in spirit. Um, but no, I, I, I was still recovering. So I wasn't, but colleagues were. And, and thank you for that. You know, it's, it's, really, it's really a community effort uh, because, again, this is a lesser known threat and it's, it's a significant threat. And because of where the Big Cypress is, in that sort of headwaters region that flows into the Southwest estuaries and flows um, into Everglades. It's so important that, that people realize that this is happening literally you know, underneath our noses. Yes, in fact, the first time I even saw this was on your website, wondering what you were doing in your new role because you're the regional director dealing with this, whether or not you're on the ground boots on the ground every single moment or not. So thank you so much for what you do. So go to questions now, Q&A. So uh, William Meese uh, asks, uh, has the proliferation of Burmese pythons in the Everglades had an impact on birds there? Or Yes, it has. It definitely has. And that's a, that's a great question. So tonight, you know, I really only touched upon one threat facing the system, and that is this oil threat, just because it's lesser known, but indeed invasive species are significant. Uh, I attended um, back before the pandemic began, I think it was December or November of 2019, I attended a science symposium at Big Cypress. And there, there we got the latest research on uh, how the pythons are affecting bird and other populations. And they had um, you know, seen the contents. They had done a study that had measured the contents and species variation of the stomachs of um, the pythons that had been captured. And uh, they put up a list of a number of important prey species, birds, Def so definitely they're being affected. And I know, you know, anecdotally, I know that people that know the preserve well, you know, we're seeing, I see a difference in just the soundscape that I hear when I visit some parts of um, habitat around Loop Road in the preserve. So that that's anecdotal, um, but a lot of people are noticing that. And I think at this point, um, you know, we know the pythons are having a major impact, but I don't know statistically what the impact is on birds or if there are certain bird species that are being impacted more than others. I don't think that science is there yet, um, but I know that folks are working really hard to try to get rid of the invasive pythons. So a lot of Q&A is, um, and, and then Karen has said she'll address this, but you should know there's a lot of Q&A about please 
send the information on who to contact on your email, um, on the email addresses of the agencies. Uh, people are pretty outraged as well they should be. Yeah, there are four people asking for, um, for specific contact information. I and see. I will definitely send that to Karen so that she can share that with you. Um, it's a string of long numbers for the permit numbers. So I, I, I'm sorry I didn't put that in one of my slides, um, but I would just emphasize again, most important is to write to uh, the state of Florida's DEP asking them to deny those 404 applications by Burnett Oil Company and writing to NPS, the National Park Service. You can email Preserve Superintendent Tom Forsyth Again, I'll share all that with Karen, um, but it's really important that they hear from you because you know, right now they are not hearing from a lot of folks. We're doing all we can to get the word out, but the more they hear from people and especially the more those letters go on record with the state of Florida's DEP, that, that really will make a difference. Great. So Leslie Austin asked, does it seem like there may be more hope for stopping the damaging oil operations in the new Biden administration, or is it too soon to tell? That's a great question. Uh, so, you know, we have got to say this. Um, well, it didn't come as a surprise that they would come back and, and try to develop oil. It did. This timing did come as a surprise. So, as I mentioned, um, the we became aware of this proposal to develop oil just literally 10 days into the new Biden administration early on when you'll recall we were all hearing um, one of the first things that the Biden Harris administration was rolling out was this climate forward agenda. And when you think about protected areas, you think, hey, our parks and preserves should be the front lines in a climate forward agenda we should not be permitting oil drilling and new carbon emissions to be coming from our protected areas. So we were, we were both hopeful and alarmed um, at the timing. And, and what we've done is we, uh, that the letter that I, I know I probably blazed through that super fast, but we put together a letter and we garnered over 100 different conservation groups as signatories and submitted that to the secretary, the new secretary of interior, Deb Holland, within days of her um, being officiated as our new, being confirmed as our new secretary. So we're hoping that, that she will pay attention um, to the voices that are rising up and calling for this, because this would be, to our knowledge, this would be the first new oil operation permitted in a national park unit anywhere nationwide under the new administration. And we're trying to prevent that. Yeah, and we don't know if we'll be successful. So to Leslie's final question, is it too soon? We're not sure, but we have uh, high hopes and expectations and, and are doing our best. This is an unfair question, probably, but in line with that, do you find that the oil companies are in bed with the new administration to any extent? I mean, this is subjective to ask you this, but or do they are they kind of against? What's your sense of that? I guess I can't I can't really answer that question directly, but what I can say is that our sense is so you know I I work locally here in South Florida, but I work for a national organization. And, and so we have the good fortune to know what's happening in other areas. And, and the sense I do get is it's, it's not so much that they're in bed, I think in bed with a new administration. I think that there are a number of very solid new officials and appointees that are doing good work, are have expertise, have solid backgrounds um, behind them. But I think what is happening is that, and this could very well be the motive, you know, I don't know, I, I can only speculate, this could very well be the motive for the timing. But what we are seeing is that um, a lot of these um, folks that have had interest, they're trying to push them through, right when the Biden Harris administration and their appointees and, and confirmed officials don't have really their feet fully under them, you know, they're taking on so much um, in trying to turn back so much uh, negative environmental policy that was enacted in the past four years. So I think what we are seeing is this rush uh, to permit uh, these disastrous developments before really anyone has had the chance to shine a, shine a real light on them. And again, that, that's just speculation. 
Thank you for that speculation. <laughs> so Aaron Virgin uh, says, very nice presentation, Dr. Abdo. Can you shed some light on Audubon Florida's role in the partnership with uh, NPCA and your work? Is their role more, more on the policy side, conservation research, or a nice blend of both? Well, great question, Erin. I can share that we work very closely with Audubon, primarily on Everglades restoration. Uh, so we work our number one policy um, alignment with Audubon Florida is around advancing funding, so state and federal funding for Everglades restoration. Now on the Big Cypress issue, our core uh, group of organizations that sort of lead, if you will, on, on Big Cypress issues are uh, NPCA, NRDC, which is Nat Natural Resources Defense Council, the Conservancy of Southwest Florida, and the Center for Biological Diversity. We're the four that really um, you know, as, as across the region, you know, all different organizations take the lead in supporting roles and different issues. And we four work on Big Cypress. But I can say that um, we're very fortunate that Audubon Florida joined us and uh, around 60 other organizations when we put forth a resolution to the Everglades Coalition, of which Audubon is a key member of the Everglades Coalition. And we put forth a resolution that would oppose this um, Burnett oil drilling and Audubon indeed uh, signed on to that and supported that fully. So, and I would also add that Audubon does um, some fantastic research on the hydrology uh, of the area, but, and uh, there was a great article published, goodness, I forget when, but um, about the hydrology and how it affects ghost orchids and other charismatic species, but it wasn't so much focused. Um, my understanding at least is that the focus is not so much on the oil threat in particular. So Carolyn McLaughlin asks, can anything be done, whoops, this just, uh, can anything be done to encourage the propagation of the rare grass you search for? Oh, oh that's a, such a, that's such a fun question. Thank you for asking. Um, well, you know, I, what, what happens is that there, there, there is a, a decent amount of the rare grass, the Everglades crabgrass around Big Cypress now, um, but I would just say for it and many other endangered and threatened plant species that there remains so much to be done to save the native germplasm, to propagate it in botanic gardens, and most importantly then to get native species into the hands of individuals so that they can grow natives as opposed to growing invasive or exotic species. Um, and I'm not saying anyone should, uh, you know, try to cultivate endangered species, you know, only cultivate what is a native species propagated from a reputable and sustainable nursery. Um, and then hopefully we'll leave it to the we'll leave it to the, um, the botanic gardens and other experts and great organizations like the Florida Native Plant Society to advocate for the policies um, and actions that would help ensure the, the long-term protection of those species. Um, but I would also just encourage you all to, to highlight the species you care about in the letters you write. It's really important that agency officials and leaders hear from you about the Everglades crabgrass and about the birds and about the bonneted bat. I mean, the federal, federally listed species, they carry extra oomph because they have protections under the Endangered Species Act. But it's really important that people, um, that our leaders and agency officials know that people care about all the diversity of species in these places. I don't know if Karen, our other plant expert, would like to add anything to that. Oh, you're muted. Oh, I'm muted. No, that was great. Thank you. Melissa, I'm kind of putting you on the spot, but you told me just today when we were talking before that um, you're seeing, you were, we were, I was talking, I was complaining about pollen and my <laughs> own issues uh, here in, in Central Florida. And you talked about the, the flowering of some species that, and, and you said this tendency to um, like rare species are suddenly blooming as though even the plant world senses that we're in acute climate urgency, uh, that the acute change. 
and I'm really putting you on the spot, but I thought your comment was really useful. If you could, as Dr. Abdo, the biologist who understands tropical biology, could you, could you say something like what you told me this afternoon? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I can, I can share that. I think, you know, for, for, uh, for our group tonight, it, I'm, I'm sure many um, folks online probably are aware that we know that species are blooming at, at really different times. So plant species are blooming at really different times now. And I'm sure many among you could talk about birds movements, perhaps, you know, I couldn't, but I imagine if birds movements are also shifting with the climate, what we do know with plants is because they're easy, they're, they're stationary to a degree, right? So if a plant is blooming, say it puts out its first bloom every April 1st, every year. And then we start to see that plant now shifting to first bloom on March 20th or March 1st. Um, that tells us that, that our environment is picking up on the climatic changes. And, and we know that from these fascinating uh, studies, um, some of the neatest uh, for historical buffs out there is you can read, um, the old uh, like Florida naturalists like John Conkle Small and others that traversed our, our area, you know, 100, I'm not gonna get the dates right here, but a long time ago, I think it was around 100 years ago, um, even going back to 1938, 1948, there's a lot of great botanists that uh, documented exact dates for flowering time. So now we can look today and, and see those differences. And, um, when you think about the connectedness of the, the birds that eat the fruits on the plants and then disperse the seeds or the insects that need to pollinate those and the interconnectedness of um, natural timing systems. Uh, yeah, we're, we're certainly in a place where we need to do all we can to, to mitigate climate change. Thanks for, for your comments. Um, Rebecca Lee uh, says or asks, is it possible for Melissa to write an op-ed on Big Cypress to the Herald Tribune to educate the public? That's a great idea, Rebecca. And absolutely, um, we would consider doing that. And maybe even if you all know influential folks, maybe one of you in your area that would, uh, we can certainly provide draft talking points. And like I said, share the letter that we wrote. So you'd have all our key advocacy asks. Um, we'd love to do that. We have so far worked to also garner, we're working, um, we've, we've worked with one um, supporting some local electeds um, and Senator Farmer, Senator Gary Farmer, I forget his district, he wrote a letter to the DEP asking them to deny the permit. So that's another advocacy idea. If you all wanna write to your elected leaders, your local state legislator, uh, and ask them and use that letter um, as a sample, ask them to write to DEP, that will really make a difference. And we're also gonna be calling on our leaders in Congress and asking them to write letters to DEP and the Park Service uh, to, to oppose this. So thanks for that, Rebecca. That's the op-ed, op-ed plus plus, absolutely. Can I ask a question, Melissa, it's Jean. Uh, where does your organization get its funding from? Or what kind of uh, structure are you? Yeah, so we are, thank you. That's a great, great question. And I'm sorry I didn't introduce it from the outset. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. And so we receive funding from sort of your standard nonprofit sources. So some grant funding from foundations, some private gifts from generous donors and supporters. Uh, we have now over 1.4 million members and supporters across the country, and over 90,000 of those are in Florida. So many of those kind people donate, uh, and then of course we we you know request the grant funding and work hard to uh, work hard to make the dollars go far. Is there a membership fee in your to become a member of your organization? Yes, there is. It is, I believe it's $25 now. Um, and we actually have, I can also send this. Um, oh, no, that, that won't make it. If we are having this Wednesday is our annual online, now online, Salute to the Parks um, event, which if people sign up for the 
salute to the parks event that NPCA is holding. I think membership is included in that. And I think that's also $25. Uh -huh. um, so I can drop the link to that in the chat as well. But thank you for asking, Jean. I just shared my screen with, um, let me close some of these oh. windows for you, with the, her the website for National Parks Conservation Association. Karen, you've got a lot of uh, information to put in the next e-blast. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Get the word out. Karen, I don't see that. I see the election of officials in oh. membership, and I don't see anything related to Melissa Interesting. here. Interesting. All right. Are you seeing it now? No. And hmm. we've lost Melissa here. I don't see her. Well, there she is. Oh, there she is. Well, all right. Um, so, somebody, so oh, okay okay are you seeing it now no no huh my screen is sharing but it's not showing you the are, i'm seeing a blank screen now not are you yeah. seeing yes yes that's seeing? correct Oh, well, maybe you can gather all this information and put it yes in it will screen. all go on in the yeah. next step Give us an opportunity to become members, to donate, and uh, to keep up the fantastic work you're doing, Melissa, with you, you and your organization. It's just for me, I didn't realize what was going on. So you've you've highlighted a really very disturbing fact, and I think that we will get a lot of um, support from our members to try and help. Um, sway our, our um, elected officials. So. Well, thank you so much, Jean and Margie and Karen. It's, it's really been such a pleasure and I'm grateful for everyone's time and for all that you all do uh, in uh, advocating for conservation policy. And I also wish you all um, well-being, especially with the Piney Point issue in, in your neck of the woods. I really hope the, the best for that. Thank you so much, Melissa. It's just thanks, so Melissa. Thanks everybody for joining today. Thank you so much. And uh, should we talk? Mention our next um, Audubon Extra coming up. Yes. yes. Go ahead. At the end of the month on April. What is it April twenty eighth? No, twenty first. Twenty first. April twenty first. Yeah. So we'll we'll be having. Jonathan Slot speaking about owls, his his bestseller, Oils of the Sorry, Owls. I've got oils on the brain. Owls of the Eastern Ice, which is a quest to find and save the world's largest owl, which is in actually eastern Russia, the Blackstone Sea Owl. And um, he he's done fascinating research in a very challenging area where um, the economies are, are very challenged and uh, the owls have to um, survive in Eastern Russia. So um, he, we're very lucky to have him and we're doing this in concert with the Sarasota library system who happened to contact him at the same time. So we joined our forces. And so please join us. It's the um, April 21st, Jonathan Slot, And he's been featured um, and the BBC and the NPR and many national uh, radio uh, programs. And uh, he's, he, he, it, we're very excited to have him join us. It's a very special program. We continue to have these wonderful presentations. I mean, it's just, they, they, it's just incredible. What a year we've had. And thank you, Melissa, for coming and so uh, sharing this with you. It's just been incredible. Thank you so much, everybody. All right. Thank you so much. Good night. And this will Bye. be um, posted tomorrow on our YouTube site. So, Good. all right. Good, Good night. night. Good night, everybody. <laughs>